if it won't scale, it'll fail. This is the philosophy that I start with uh, on whatever I do. A uh, little bit about me, I worked for uh, PayPal and eBay. I worked for Reddit, I was first employee there. Uh, I worked for Netflix and was the first reliability engineer there. And so that's a, the quick gist. Uh, this is a graph of, it's a diagram of the traffic of Reddit through the growth of the time that I was there. And I love this visualization because you can see how it basically doubled every quarter. Uh, and then the, that's the graph of the number of countries Netflix was in at the time that I worked there. So a lot of what I was doing there was launching countries. So I'm going to start by talking about using the cloud. Luckily, I don't have to spend a lot of time on this anymore, but back in the day, I used to have to convince a lot of people about that. I just want to tell a quick story about the cloud. This is when Reddit uh, was using the cloud, and it was useful because that yellow line is the traffic, and the blue bars are the cost. And so you can see we launched Reddit Gold, which is the subscription program. Our costs went way up because we had to support that program, and then we were able to optimize our usage and level off our costs. And all of that was possible because of the cloud. So I've been a cloud advocate for 10, 11 years now. Uh, and luckily, most people agree with me on that one. But one of the important things about the cloud is building your software to be cloud native, making it so that it works well in the cloud. Uh, and so some people call this microservices. Uh, and the reason this is important is because the microservices and micro teams work really well together. And so I'm going to talk about that. Uh, a bit. Uh, this is an example of the Netflix ecosystem. So you can see there's a bunch of devices, it hits a front end API, then it hits a bunch of services behind it. Uh, and so, you know, it's divided up like that. Uh, and so each of those services is built by a different small team. Uh, and so the really nice thing about doing that uh, is that there's technical and, and human advantages to that, right? So technical advantages include things like making it easier to auto scale and capacity planning uh, and uh, diagnosing problems and things like that. Uh, and then the, uh, the human aspect to it is because the services are built by different teams with different owners, that API is the door between those teams. So each little team can operate however they want to operate. And it doesn't matter as long as they are providing an API that the other team can use. Uh, and so it makes it really easy to, for each team to work differently. Uh, so, you know, some teams might have very rigorous deployment models and spend a lot of time testing, and other teams will just take whatever is Git pushed into master and just deploy it right out. Uh, and it doesn't matter because as long as each team is responsible for their own service and making it work, as long as, and the API is working, they can communicate. And so it makes it really easy for teams to communicate because they're just small teams and they can still, they still work together, they still work in the same place, so they can still talk to each other uh, and say, you know, I need your API to do this or this, but by making that API the middle, uh, it becomes uh, easier to coordinate between these small teams. So I've done a bunch of surveys, I've talked to a bunch of companies that run microservices, and on average, it's about 25% of their engineering resources are being spent on that platform. Uh, either all of their, you know, a quarter of everybody's time or a quarter of their engineers are doing that. Uh, and so that team becomes very important because they're building the tools that enable all the developers to move rapidly and use this, this model, this services, cloud, you know, DevOps model. Uh, so, talking about a DevOps model, uh, this, this is sort of the, my tenets of the DevOps model is uh, one is building for three. So it's this idea of redundancy, you have three of everything so that if you lose one, you still have two, you can do writes, et cetera. Uh, as much automation as possible, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, uh, automation is key in everything that you do because nothing is going to scale if you have to have a human in the loop. The moment you put a human in the loop, uh, you're slowing yourself down. Uh, and also, uh, independent teams being responsible for both dev and ops, right? So teams being fully responsible uh, from beginning to end uh, so that they are responsible when things break. And then having a team that builds the tools to enable that. So I think that works best. And so when t people talk about the DevOps team, in my mind, that means the people who are building the tools to enable developer velocity. And this is how you end up scaling your organization, by having a team that's dedicated to making tools, making everyone else's life easier. 
Uh, at Netflix, we had a, this idea of freedom and responsibility. Uh, and so the idea was that you have, as a developer, the freedom to do what you want to do. Uh, and then you have to be responsible for, for whatever happens. Uh, everyone was really good at the freedom part, not so good at the responsible part. Uh, but you know, accountability ended up happening sort of naturally. Uh, and then the nice thing is that uh, by doing this, w we provided a platform so the developers could change their code whenever they wanted, they could deploy whenever they wanted, uh, they could manage their own auto-scaling, and so on and so forth, uh, and they had to fix their stuff at four in the morning when it breaks, right? Uh, and so, oops, there we go. Uh, and, and that was really helpful because it meant that they built, built better software because they were the ones who were getting woken up at four in the morning. <laughs> and so uh, it was important to have the developers own the product from beginning to end. If the customers weren't happy, then the developer wasn't happy. And this was great for accountability because this meant that everybody was accountable to, to happy customers. And that was a great way to run an engineering or organization. Uh, another thing that we did to really scale the organization was to get rid of policies. So in most companies, policies come about because something bad happens and somebody says, we need to put a process in place to make sure this never happens again. And they're very prescriptive and inflexible and nobody ever follows them because the new person doesn't know the policy or they don't have time or they don't want to deal with the paperwork. Uh, and so at Netflix, we sort of did the opposite. We would remove policies. If something, if a policy caused a problem, we would get rid of it. Uh, when I first started at Netflix, we had change control, for example. You had to file a change control ticket to make a change. Uh, and it didn't work because a lot of people just didn't file the ticket. Some people filed the ticket after they made the change, just as a record keeping, but it wasn't great. Uh, the tickets were sometimes filed and the change never happened, and that was just confusing. Uh, and so we just got rid of change control. We said, forget it. We're not even going to bother with change control tickets. We're just going to make changes, and instead, we're going to build a tool that simply reflects reality. So we built a tool that logs all the changes in production, and anybody could look at that tool at any time. And that was far more useful, because it told you exactly what happened, when it happened, at the right time, and it was automatic. And that was the key, it was automatic. The person making the change didn't have to do anything to get that change recorded. So let's talk about setting up a scalable infrastructure. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, automation is key everywhere. So infrastructure as code is a great way to manage things. Uh, you, you know, put everything in change control, like GitHub change control or whatever. Uh, you know, in, enable your continuous delivery and so on. So the more automatic things are, the faster you can deploy and the faster that you can roll back. If you're changing your infrastructure with automation, it's easy to roll it back. And being able to roll back is super key because then you feel much more comfortable making changes. If you, if you believe that you can quickly roll a change back, then you feel a lot more comfortable making a more drastic change because you know that you'll be able to roll it back quickly and it will have a small effect. So automating everything, application startup, code deployment, system deployment, all of that stuff, as much as absolutely possible. Right, and, and there's some challenges to this, uh, and you lose track of resources, and there's like individual snowflakes, but the biggest uh, one of all is fear. A lot of people do not believe in their own automation. They fear their automation. They will set all this stuff up and then still run it manually because they don't trust their own system to be successful. And that's probably one of the biggest holdups of automated deployment is fear. Uh, you see that in a lot of companies where they're like, yeah, we can totally do an automated deployment, but we don't. We have someone who has to hit enter. Why? Because we're worried it's not going to work. Why don't you fix your system so you don't have to worry about that? Uh, and how do we get to a point where we trust our automation? We have to have actionable metrics. Uh, these are some graphs from, uh, uh, from Reddit, actually. These are really old graphs. They're probably 10 years old at this point. Uh, but looking at this graph, you can see that something bad happened, uh, right? There's HTTP status on the, on the right side, and something bad is going on. But we have no idea what. These are not actionable metrics. Uh, we can add in a bunch more metrics, and that makes them even less actionable, because now we really don't have any idea what's going on. <laughs> So how do we fix this problem? 
Uh, well, at Netflix, we developed a monitoring system, uh, which is open source, and uh, called Atlas. And what it had was uh, math built into the monitoring system, effectively. Uh, you can also get this commercially, by the way, from like a company like SignalFX or something, or Datadog. Uh, and what it did is, you'll see here, the blue, the blue line is actual data. The red line is predicted data. So it's called, <coughs> it's, uh, called smoothing on the line, double exponential smoothing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's essentially predicting what the graph should look like. And the green bars are the difference between actual and predicted. That's the alarm, effectively. So you can graph the math on the graph and then alarm on it. So on this metric, for example, you have alarms on the green bars. So there's no st static thresholds or anything like that. It's all about monitoring uh, it, the, the changes, right? So it's dynamic thresholds. Uh, and that was super key for making all of this stuff work to make everything actionable because things are changing so often you need to have the dynamic thresholds. Uh, and another type of actionable met metric is actually user metrics. Uh, so this is an example from Reddit where uh, we had the search bar and everybody would complain, search sucks, it's terrible, blah, blah, blah. And we're like, all right, let's get some data around how much search sucks. And so we added that button. It just says, was this useful, yes or no? And we ran it for a while, and we found out like 70% of the people would click yes. So we're like, okay, that's not bad. 70% of the people say that they're finding what they want. Then we changed our search backend, and we didn't tell anybody. And all of a sudden, that number went up to like 92%. And so we're like, okay, that change was definitely useful. That was a good change. And then eventually, we told everybody, hey, we changed the, the backend. And, and then that number went up to like 95%. So some people were, were actually convinced when we told them that it was changed, that it was better. But what we knew was that it was already better because we'd already seen the, the change. And so this was a good example of an actual metric. It was super easy and user feedback. And the important thing with a monitoring system is self-service. So one of the things we built was a system that was totally self-service, where developers can put any metric they want into the system, they can put an alert on any metric in the system. They can put an alert on the com combination of metrics. They can put alerts on other people's metrics. Uh, and that was super important because sometimes a team would want to monitor uh, their downstream or their upstream service to see if that's healthy. And if they started getting alerts for an upstream service, they could, it could potentially indicate a problem in their own system. And so the self-service was really important, making it possible for anyone to put any metric into the system. It was also very hard uh, because it, it uh, meant that the metrics and monitoring system was, uh, could randomly get a huge influx of new metrics if somebody deployed some new code with metrics. So that presented its own challenges. But the nice thing was that it allowed us to put business metrics into the monitoring system. And that was super important because, uh, as I'll talk about in a second, monitoring business metrics is more useful than, than machines and hardware. But once you have a good monitoring system, it allows you to move up. So this is from a, a company called Armory. They uh, essentially have commercialized Netflix's deployment tool, Spinnaker. Uh, and they have this chart that they like to use uh, that I blatantly stole from them. Uh, and it talks about the different stages that you can get to as a company. Uh, and stage three is the whole continuous delivery and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and to get beyond stage three and four, you need to have good automation uh, and you need to have good metrics and monitoring because you need to be able to see, uh, you need to be able to have the machine know about changes automatically, to be automatic, to have automatic resolution and so on and so forth. Uh, so as I said, uh, choose business metrics, not machine metrics. That's super critical because at the end of the day, your customers don't care if server A is failing. All they care about is that they can't use your website or whatever it is. Uh, and then, um, if you're in the cloud, especially, don't even bother with monitoring individual machines. It just doesn't matter. Uh, we, we had that data, but we almost never used it. Like if a machine, the only reason we kept that data was so that we could see if one machine in a cluster was not behaving the same as the rest, and then we would just delete the machine. We wouldn't even look at it, unless it repeatedly happened over and over and over again. Then we might dig into that machine to figure out why. Otherwise, we're just like, meh, it's an anomaly. We don't even care. As long as it doesn't affect the user, it doesn't even matter. Uh, another important tip was to alert on an increase of failure, not a lack of success. 
So if you're monitoring website traffic, you don't want to monitor if there's a huge drop. Uh, one of my favorite stories was we, were, we had alerts on a drops in traffic. And all of a sudden, in Latin America, the traffic just dropped off. And we had no idea why. We started investigating on the machines. We're like, oh, crap, what's going on? What's happening? Eventually, I don't even know why I looked at the news site, but I found out that there was this huge football match between Mexico and Brazil. And we're like, oh, that's why no one's watching Netflix in South America. And if we had been alerting on the opposite, then we would have just seen it, the, the graphs would have followed along with that. So it, would have been, it wouldn't have been a, uh, a lack of success that we were alerting on, because there was no increase of failure. Uh, and when we're talking about monitoring, uh, how many people does this mean something to you? Oh, awesome. All right. So this is percentiles, basically, right? So look at these, this graph. This is a graph of the same data with three different percentiles. The blue line at the bottom is the 50th percentile. The next one is the uh, 90th, and the top is the 99th. So what do we glean from here? Uh, the average customer is having a great experience. They're having a couple millisecond response time. This is response time for a website. Uh, so they're having a great experience. The 90th percentile, they're having a pretty good experience too. But the 99th percentile, they're having a terrible experience. And this is meaningful because it depends on your business whether you care about the 99th percentile. Do you care that 1% of your customers are having a terrible experience? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're like, there's nothing we can do, and that 1% is going to have a terrible experience. And sometimes you do care. So it's really important when you're looking at your metrics to think about not just averages, because averages can hide a lot of information. Uh, you can estimate your percentiles. Somebody developed an algorithm fairly recently to estimate percentiles as you go, so you don't need all the data at once. Uh, and it's called um, T-Digest. Uh, and the errors actually are interesting, because the error on the percentile calculations get worse in the middle. Uh, which is great, because usually you don't care about the middle, you care about the extremes. Uh, and so this is a good, uh, good way to calculate percentiles as you go, which is a good way to do your monitoring. Um, but I want to show you this real quick. So this is called Ansem's Quartet. Uh, every one of those graphs fits these constraints. But as you can see, the graphs look very different. So even though you might be monitoring and you think you're monitoring the right things, you have to think about how is the way that you are displaying your data affecting your decisions and your, your perception of the data, right? Because you, you can display it in very different ways to make it look really good or really bad. So you have to make sure you're not tricking yourself into thinking that everything is great because you're displaying it to yourself in a great way. Uh, another really important thing that I like to tell everybody is to use cues as much as possible. Uh, cues are a great way to balance out load, and they're a great way to do monitoring because you can monitor queue lengths. But if you're monitoring queue lengths, there's something important that you need to know, right? If you have a queue, then you have a queue depth graph such as this one. Uh, but you can see something has gone wrong here, right? All of a sudden, thing, the queue depth is getting deeper. Why is it getting deeper? We don't know. So this is where I like to talk about cumulative flow diagrams. Uh, these are really important if you're monitoring anything that increases linearly, like queue depths. Uh, and if you look at the graph now, essentially this is the number of inputs and outputs to a queue. And now you can see exactly where the problem lies. You can see that the departures have slowed down. So the input into the graph is the same rate, but it's processing slower. So now you know where to focus your efforts. You know to look at whatever it is that's taking things off the queue uh, as the place where something might be broken. So cumulative flow diagram, if you take nothing else away from this talk, take that. Uh, and also useful is the fact if you know very basic queuing theory, then you know that capacity utilization increases queues exponentially. What does this mean in practice? What that means is that if you take away machines from your queue processing and your graph does not grow exponentially, then you are over-provisioned. Uh, if, uh, if you start growing exponentially without doing anything, then you're under-provisioned. Uh, and so knowing the shape of the line of the curve helps you predict how much infrastructure you need to process that queue. 
Uh, and then variability in a queue is also very important. So this is two ways to design a queue. Uh, you could look at a bunch of machines and have one queue for each. Uh, you can have one master queue. Uh, the way we used to do things at Reddit was, uh, at first we had one master queue, and that sucked because you'd get a slow request at the front, the head of the queue, and it would block the whole thing. So we divided it across multiple machines, uh, and then you'd get a slow request at the head of every queue, and now you had a bunch of machines that were blocked. Uh, and so eventually we solved this problem by creating uh, multiple queues of different speed requests. So we would monitor each type of API call, how fast they were. We'd put fast ones over here, slow ones over here. And so the way you divide up your queues can really have an effect on what you're doing. Uh, then another thing, really important, chaos engineering. This idea of simulating things that go wrong uh, and finding things that are different. So the two most important things to test in a distributed system are uh, instance loss and increased latency or slowness. Uh, the first one is, is so I'll talk about the Simeon Army, which you may have heard of. Uh, we all system choices assume that something is going to fail at some point. Uh, and so we created the Simeon Army. You may have heard of the Chaos Monkey. Uh, there was a bunch of other monkeys that my team created. Uh, the Chaos Gorilla, the Chaos Kong killed larger and larger things. Uh, and so the Chaos Monkey, which you may have heard of, killed machines in production randomly. This is a great way to make sure that people were writing good software that could handle instance failures. Uh, we just turned it on and did that to them. Uh, <laughs> and then they would say, hey, my stuff's breaking. And we're like, good, you should fix your stuff. <laughs> and it worked. People would start writing better software because they knew it was coming. And the same with all the other monkeys. They knew it was coming. They would write good software. But it kept everybody honest because if we had turned it off, people would have gotten lazy. So we just kept it going. And after a while, a chaos monkey was meaningless to everybody because it would keep destroying stuff and it didn't affect anybody. Uh, so we had to build a bigger monkey. <laughs> we had to kill more stuff, make people get better at fi figuring it out, build even bigger, kill even more things. But the really important one was the latency, latency monkey because detecting slow is a lot harder than de detecting down. Uh, and so we built the latency monkey to induce slowness between services uh, and this really helped each service tune uh, what does slow mean to me because every service slow could be something different. One service might need five millisecond responses, another service might be fine with five second responses and it totally depends on the service. We had to build a, b a bunch of other stuff too because we were an Amazon like janitor monkey that cleaned up extra services, uh, howler monkey that told us when Amazon was doing stupid things that we couldn't fix uh, and stuff like that. Uh, quick, uh, mostly I like this slide just because I met Mr. Data, and so I, got to, I get to put this picture up. Uh, but quick tips on data, having multiple copies of the data and keep those in multiple places uh, and don't put it all on one machine or one person's head. Uh, and then the last thing I want to really quickly talk about uh, is incident reviews and making sure that when you have an incident review at your company, uh, it is a collaborative environment. Uh, one place that I worked, the incident review was to figure out whose bonus was going to get docked for the outage. So of course nobody wanted to come. So then they made the rule that if you didn't come, it was you. <laughs> so then everybody would come and be quiet. And it was a terrible place to have an incident review because nobody would ever want to claim responsibility for anything. Uh, at, at Netflix, it was the exact opposite. People would come running into the room saying, I know what happened, what went wrong, and I know why, and I'm, this is how I'm going to fix it, and I need these people's help, and everybody got really excited about helping people fix problems, uh, and that was the environment that we really liked, that collaborative, I know what went wrong, I know how to fix it, uh, and let's do this together, and let's build tools that find classes of problems. Uh, my company right now is all built on uh, serverless, uh, and so I like serverless because it means I don't have to admin machines, which I really don't like to do despite the fact that I've been doing it for like 25 years. Uh, but machines suck and I hate them, so I'm happy to let Amazon take care of it for me. Uh, so that is how I'm scaling my company now. Uh, the other way I'm scaling my company is via remote work. Uh, and so really quickly, some of the benefits of remote work are, uh, number one, you must have a culture of remote work. You can't just have the one remote person. You're going to need to have the remote everybody. Uh, everything should be asynchronous as much as possible. There should be no difference between being in an office and not being if you have one. We don't have one. 
Uh, but one of the nice things about this microservices, distributed computing, is it really lends itself nicely to remote work because then your team, can small teams maybe are clustered in one or two time zones and they can work together, but if you have another small team in a way different time zone, it makes it easier. Going back to the whole APIs are the key of communication. Uh, what people have generally found is nine time zones is sort of the max that you can handle in a company, but you know, maybe you can stretch that to 10, which is how far South Africa is from the west coast of, Cal of the United States. Um, Large open source projects are a great model for how to handle all this because uh, they do everything asynchronously and distributed. So, you know, look at the Linux kernel or something to see how they handle it. So, quickly wrapping up, putting it all together, use the cloud, microservices and DevOps, uh, empowering your engineers with self-service, automating everything, monitoring the right things, using chaos testing, breaking things on purpose, uh, serverless, so don't bother with machines, and uh, for me at least, remote first culture. And now I think I have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, what does recovery after taking out an entire data center look like? <laughs> uh, it doesn't look pleasant the first time you do it, that's for sure. Uh, ideally, your software is written such that it, it does not have any major effect. That is the goal. Uh, in reality, that is not at all what happens. So typically what happens is you have a lot of thundering herds where you know some service comes back up and everything tries to hit it at once. Uh, there's software that you can write. Uh, Netflix made some open source software that helps with this. Random back offs, uh, things like that. But generally, it's, it's mostly painful on the data stores uh, because all of a sudden everything needs to get data again. And so the goal of that whole project was to induce that failure specifically so we could see where the worst parts of the failure were and then uh, you know, make software that fixes it. But the data stores was the worst. That's where the biggest problems were. I just yell it out, I'll repeat it. Um, so you mentioned open source stuff that you built with Netflix a few times. Yeah. Uh, how did Netflix get right building stuff that's obviously competitive advantage, but then open sourcing it as being competitive? How does Netflix get right open sourcing things that might be competitive advantage? Um, so the general rule in Netflix was if it has to do with infrastructure, it can be open source, and if it has to do with movies, it can't. So that was pretty much how Netflix got out. Netflix did not consider how we ran our infrastructure to be a competitive advantage. Uh, we were more than happy to tell everybody how we did it because we didn't think that that was our advantage. Our advantage was our, our licensing and our UI and our recommendation engine mainly. And so you'll never see an open source project about recommendations or AI or anything like that. Um, but all of the infrastructure we considered to be not an advantage. Yeah. Would you say that um, was a big part of Netflix's culture, being an open source contributor? Uh, was that a big part of our culture? Uh, not at first. So at first, nobody really even thought about open sourcing. Uh, then one person just said, I'd like to open source my project. And we all went, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, and he did. And then somebody else did. And then we took some of our existing projects and open sourced them. And then going forward, developers would say, OK, I'm going to build this in the open or designed for open source. And you can see the difference, because the projects that are older, uh, the code isn't as understandable. It's kind of terrible. Uh, and internally, it sucked, because the code names were different for the open source project versus the internal. So towards the end, they had the same code names as they were designed to be open source from the beginning. But uh, some of our internal code names couldn't be used externally for various copyright reasons, mostly. Uh, and so we had to change them. And so it was super confusing if you worked internally, because somebody would mention the external name, and you're like, that's some weird Greek god, and I know that's one of our projects, but I don't know which one, because they were all named after Greek gods for some reason, or related to Greek gods. So yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on Netflix's culture of only hiring senior devs. 
So um, have you seen any like um, benefits or any downsides to the culture when you're having senior devs in the company? Yeah, so, so one of the, the benefits was uh, everybody was very mature and most people had done the, the, whatever it is that they were doing previously. So that was really nice. Uh, generally mature and senior engineers, when they say they'll get something done, they'll get it done. Not a lot of hand-holding, not a lot of mentoring. Uh, the biggest downside is occasionally we did have to hire junior engineers, specifically on my team, because it was really hard to find senior engineers who were willing to work like Saturday night overnight shifts when we were doing it on call. Uh, and the way we actually solved that was through automation and making it so we didn't have to have Saturday night overnight shifts. Some senior engineers loved it, because it was like, oh, I could spend time with my family, whatever, but then it was a problem because they didn't get to be with us and had to work on solo projects. Uh, but generally, it worked out nicely, uh, but Netflix could get away with that because they had a lot of revenue, so they could afford to pay those salaries. That was probably the biggest downside for most any other company would be it's expensive to hire only senior engineers. Uh, I mean, it was a great place to work don't get, uh, because of that, but it's, it's not cheap. So you have to be pretty profitable to, to do that. Uh, yeah. Is this type of architecture more expensive because developers have responsibility? I don't think so, honestly. I think, I think if you give, it, it's harder to give junior engineers this kind of responsibility, mostly because they're gonna screw it up. But, uh, so it's more expensive in that sense, I guess. Uh, but giving developers response of, or freedom actually tends to make it cheaper because they like working in that kind of environment. Right, so it's, it's easier to hire in an environment where engineers know they're gonna get to do what they think is the right thing to do. Uh, it's, it's probably a trade-off. At the end of the day, it probably is a wash, honestly. Um, it's probably no effect either way, but. Um, hi, is it on? Closer, ah, there we are. Um, just a, a more fun question. In building all of these automation tools and like fleet monitoring and auto, automated fixing of problems and stuff like that, uh, what has been your favorite tool to play around with to explore to build these things? Maybe it didn't end up being useful and make it into production, but yeah, what's one of the more oh, interesting Oh, what is my favorite tool that we built? That is a really good question. Um, I didn't realize this was a job interview. Um, <laughs> I, I honestly, I think building the monkeys is a lot of fun. Like destroying stuff in production and seeing what happens, that was a lot of fun, right? Uh, it was less fun when the engineers would come and complain about it, but I think it was a lot of fun to do that initially. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, probably that, I, I'd have to really rack my brain to even think about what tools we built that didn't make it to production. Oh, what do we use to build it? Um, oh, um, I mean, well, I write all my code in Python, because that's just what I know. Uh, most of the stuff at Netflix is written in Java, because when you hire senior engineers, that's what you tend to get. Um, <laughs> but uh, although, although it's been shifting to more Python, and now, now lately it's been a lot of like JavaScript and React and that kind of stuff, especially for the front. But, um, yeah, I mean, we built, uh, we built all this stuff in Python. Back then, there wasn't this, uh, the Bodo library, for example, for EC2 was just, it was somewhat mature, but not super mature. Uh, I actually got to make contributions back to that library because like Amazon would release a feature that pretty much was only Netflix needed, but it wasn't supported in, in Bodo, so I wrote a thing, and then the guy who wrote Bodo was like, that's awesome, and I'm gonna go completely rewrite it because your code sucks. Uh, who, and he actually ended up being my co-founder with me on my last startup, but um, yeah, it was great because I got to contribute to these like tools that everyone was using and then get told I was a terrible engineer, which wasn't a big surprise, but uh, yeah, so that was fun too, getting to contribute to those, those tools like that. I was curious, um, as a full remote team um, split up and everybody had the freedom to deploy code, was there anything like um, linting, code changes, um, uh, maybe pull request reviews, just to ensure maintainability on code? Yeah, so, so at Netflix we didn't have remote. 
Um, it's, that's how I ran, run my company now. But um, it, at Netflix, it was some teams required pull requests, some teams did not. It was up to the team. Uh, for us, we try to do everything in a pull request, specifically so that there's some sort of log of what happened. Uh, and, and in my company, we, we do the same, like, you know, no policies, freedom, and so on. So if you want to approve your own pull request, you totally can do that. And that happens a lot when it's a simple change or whatever. But, but developers are pretty good about saying, hey, I'm not 100% on this change, so I'm going to request a, a review on this or something like that. Yeah, so that's, that's generally how we make sure to maintain code quality is through pull requests. And you know, sometimes I'll look at the self-approved pull requests and be like, nee, you maybe not, should have not done that. You should ask for some review on that first, but yeah. All right, I see end, so thank you very much, and I'll be around the rest of the day if anyone wants to ask any other questions.